Last week, there was kind of a terrifying event on the N train in Brooklyn. It was one of those stories you couldn't really avoid, even if you wanted to. And I'm not going to talk about that event in particular. There's been more than enough coverage already. But I wanted to use this week to talk more generally and share some data about safety risks on our transportation system, how we think about them, and how we talk about them. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics, always welcome, but this week I'm just doing my own thing. This is going to be a bit different from my usual video. A little more direct, fewer frantic visuals, a little less dry humor. Well, we'll see. The subject matter just doesn't necessarily lend itself to belly laughs. So a lot of this is just going to be me talking to the camera. So it's no secret that there's sort of a perverse symbiotic relationship between news organizations and news consumers when it comes to things like subway shootings or terrorism events or plane crashes or like shark attacks. What's the old saying? If it bleeds, it leads. Events that come out of the blue and disrupt our usual day-to-day -day are completely irresistible to our lizard brains, and the media companies are well aware of that. I like this graphic from Hannah Ritchie and Max Roser at the University of Oxford. It shows how the relative amounts of media coverage of different deadly events bears almost no relationship whatsoever to the things people actually die from. So this video is about fatalities on our transportation system, and this is a personal topic for a lot of people. Even if you're lucky enough not to have lost someone you care about to traffic violence, the odds are you're close to someone who has. Now, my perspective on this kind of comes from what is normally my day job when I'm not making scintillating YouTube videos. You see, anytime you do any kind of transportation or traffic study, you have to go grab the last three to five years of crash data from the study area, analyze it to see if you can find any recurring safety issues, and recommend appropriate countermeasures. And for me, what really synced in over time was just the incredible variety of terrible things that can happen when cars are traveling at high speeds and things that are just really beyond a driver's control. Mechanical issues, tire blowouts, animals darting into the roadway, cars coming from the opposite direction where the driver was blacked out on a cocktail of vodka and non-prescription pharmaceuticals. You'll see all of those kinds of things in crash records. And just looking at it and sitting with it day in and day out is really one of the primary reasons that today I just drive as little as possible. But also just to keep with a the recent theme on this channel, the other thing that really made an impression on me is actually the National Transit Database. Yeah, it has a lot more than unlinked passenger trips and vehicle revenue hours in it. Scouring the NTD was sort of my grad school job, and one of the things I discovered going through it that really stopped me in my tracks was the safety and security data. As someone who is an unapologetic transit lover, it was a real gut punch just to kind of stare at this data and see how people die on our public transportation systems, even if it is a relatively small number. So bottom line, when it comes to terrible events on the transportation system, one way of making sense of them comes in the form of a numbingly steady flow of very sterile spreadsheets. And another way of understanding them comes in the form of sensational news items that consume the media oxygen for days on end. And look, I understand it and I acknowledge that something like what happened on the N train is traumatic for an entire city. It's even traumatic for people who live outside the city. But I don't think relying on media coverage to help us know what's actually important necessarily leads to good individual decisions or good policy. So let's zoom out for a moment. The CDC publishes an annual report that shows that year's causes of mortality for people in the US. And they're all bad. Some of them are maybe somewhat preventable. Some of them are more likely to happen in old age. And then you have traffic fatalities, which are categorized under quote unquote accidents, which are they still doing this? I thought we weren't doing this anymore. Anyway, again, all deaths are bad, but traffic violence in particular is a lot more likely to cut someone down when they're otherwise relatively young and healthy. These are deaths that are just shocking when they happen and 
They've ripped people away from us in just an instant. I'm not gonna get deep into the crash versus accident terminology issue. There's a lot of information out there if you're handy with Google. I would just take a moment though to look at where the US ranks on traffic fatalities compared to our neighbors to the north and south as well as other G7 and G7-ish countries. And when you look at this, you really have to ask yourself, is accidental, honestly, a good word for what we're looking at? Just think about the things that make all these countries different. How much people drive, how the roads are designed, what kind of safety culture they have, how they talk about traffic violence and how seriously they take it. So this is in the ballpark of 35 to 40,000 people we lose on our roadway system every year. For most of this video, I'm gonna focus on 2019 because I do prefer to look at pre-pandemic data, but I just wanna acknowledge that the final reporting for 2020 showed fatalities actually increased over 2019 despite overall vehicle miles traveled decreasing, which is the opposite of what you'd expect for a correlation. So the pandemic has really defeated whatever notion we might have had of traffic volume being kind of a base rate for traffic fatalities. Instead, it turns out uncongested roads are sort of their own form of traffic danger. So let's dive into the 2019 data from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. We really do get inured to numbers like this, so I wanted to peel it apart a bit so we have a chance to see it fresh. Note that throughout this video, I'm really gonna be focusing on fatalities, but that's just a small slice of the overall mayhem. You can see that for every fatality, there's something like 80 injuries, and a lot of those are life altering. Some of this comes from traffic safety facts, which the NHTSA publishes each year. Table 41 is interesting. It breaks down fatalities by what kind of roadway they occurred on. By the way, let me know if you want me to do a video on roadway functional classification. It's really influential on policy, kind of interesting, and sort of insidious. So you can see the plurality of crashes happen on principal arterial slash other, which I think the correct translation for that is strode, high speed, multi-lane, tons of conflict points. Some of the minor arterials are probably strode too. This isn't a surprise if you ever look at safety studies or Vision Zero documents. The maps always look like this. See if you can guess where the strodes are. The underlying data here is from the NHTSA's Fatality Analysis Reporting System, which you can download the whole database if you're so inclined, and if you do, you'll see some really disturbing data fields, like this one, Critical Pre-Crash Event. They have 57 different codes for all the different things that can occur just before a fatal crash. And a lot of them are just things that are beyond a driver's control. Just nightmare stuff. Yeah, approaching vehicle crosses over the center line is obviously bad, but then you get things like tire blowout, suddenly encountered poor road conditions, animal in roadway, I mean, just seeing these in the data from actual crashes will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Or driver-related factors. I mean, you don't know who's driving the other car. Some of these, the fact that they even have codes for them is disturbing in itself. You've got code for reaction to or failure to take drugs slash medication. Code eight, road rage slash aggressive driving. And I don't even know what to do with code 13, mentally challenged. Is that something we even say anymore? Well, the NHTSA does. But here's the single thing that I find the most mind blowing. You'd think if you have 35,000 traffic fatalities, it's gonna be about 17,500 men and 17,500 women, right? Well, wrong. Try 25,000 men and 10,000 women. And it's not because men drive more than women, so they have like a higher base rate. If you look at crash events that result in a death or injury, it is pretty much 50-50 men and women, like you'd expect. For fatalities, it's worse than 70-30. It's completely nuts. I'm not gonna editorialize on that further, other than if you ever wondered why men pay higher insurance premiums than women, well, there you have it. It's just actuarial science. So here's a takeaway. I think one reason you don't see more concern for this country's horrifically high crash fatality rates is 
People just don't think it'll happen to them. Everybody thinks they're an above average driver, which of course is mathematical nonsense. They think they're in control of their own destiny and the averages don't apply to them. But I hope some of what I've shared so far impresses on you that it's really just the illusion of self-determination. And there's an incredible variety of factors that come into play that you as a driver do not control. Okay, brief time out from the darkness that is this particular topic. Drop a like on the video if you're finding it, I don't know, entertaining? Eh, seems like the wrong word. Subscribe and hit the notification bell if you're looking for weekly videos on like whatever I decide to make a video about that week. And mandatory sub count check. The channel now has enough subscribers to fill Progressive Field, home of the Cleveland Guardians. Progressive didn't make my top 10 ballparks list, but it was close, and I am a fan. I believe it was the second neo-traditional ballpark to come online after Camden Yards. I just wish there was something else happening at the home plate entrance. It's kind of forbidding. But I do love that the Guardians themselves are like a stone's throw away from the ballpark itself. So over time, the transportation industry has put incredible resources and ingenuity, aka engineering, the words come from the same Latin root, behind improving safety for drivers and passengers. The technology of things like airbags and crumple zones is light years ahead of what it was in like 1990. And you can see all that in the annual data. If you'll get fatalities per million vehicle miles traveled, which is a typical measure. With some fluctuations, the big picture is that over time, crashes have become more survivable for people in cars. But over the same period, things got worse for pedestrians. We talked in a previous video about how the overall vehicle fleet is getting bigger and heavier. And at the same time, manufacturers haven't really been compelled to put any ingenuity behind improving the survivability of crashes for pedestrians or for people biking. The problem is the things that are gonna keep pedestrians safe aren't engineering solutions as much as they are policy solutions. To me, vision zero means low speeds like 25 miles per hour max outside of freeways. And instead of spending trillions on the kind of enforcement and traffic calming hardscape you'd need to ensure everyone was going 25, how about speed governors on all our amazing technologically advanced new cars? I mean, this really is all about cars. Nobody's dying in a pedestrian on pedestrian collision. Before we wrap up here, let's take another look at the FARS database. I'd just quickly note that the primary file in the data set is called quote unquote accident, but let's take a closer look at a couple of the more obscure files in the set. There's one called NM Distract or Non-Motorist Distractions. It's got codes for all the different ways a pedestrian or a bicyclist could possibly have been distracted while they were just walking around minding their own business moments before their life was ended. Look at some of these. Code 12, distracted by animal, other object, event, or activity. Code 7, adjusting or listening to portable audio device. Code 13, eating or drinking, or a really great one. Code 97, lost in thought slash daydreaming. These are all apparently things you should not do while you're walking around. The data set includes other curious variables or explanations for how and why a crash killed a pedestrian. Like pedestrian crash type, some of the available codes in the user's manual are 120, dispute related, Code 360, ice cream truck related. I swear I'm not making that up. And code 160, pedestrian loss of control. I can't even imagine what that last one means. Anyway, it's amazing that when you go through the data, there are all kinds of things that excuse driver error. Mechanical problems, bad lighting conditions, animals in the roadway, people in the roadway. But when it comes to pedestrians, well, don't listen to music while you're walking, don't eat while you're walking, and by all means, don't daydream. And this all comes from the US Department of Transportation. And it's just disheartening that 
The entire way crashes are viewed basically just assumes that drivers in general are doing what they're supposed to be doing, operating 3,000 pound plus vehicles, plus or minus, I don't know, 15 miles per hour of whatever the posted speed is, with some minimum level of skill that was established when they took a test when they were 16. And if crashes happen, well, what did you expect? Life isn't perfect. Accidents happen. And it's just the price of admission for the glorious freedom of being able to convey yourself around civilization in a climate controlled glass and metal box. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna share from FARS is the vehicle file. This will tell you every possible attribute of every vehicle that was involved in a fatal crash. But let's take a look at travel speed. These are actual travel speeds of vehicles involved in fatal crashes in 2019. You know, they have to put speed governors on e-bikes and e-scooters to make sure you don't go more than like 18 to 20 miles an hour. Eh, that's my only real comment on this. So what we have is a transportation system that's organized around individuals driving around enormously heavy personal vehicles, making moment to moment decisions about how fast to drive, how aggressive to maneuver, whether they're well rested or sober enough to be behind the wheel, whether they can personally manage road conditions and visibility. Every driver makes their own individual decisions about each of those things. And the outcome is we lose 35 to 40,000 people to traffic violence every year. Let me just say, if 100 people a day were getting killed on subways or any other form of transit every day, you would never stop hearing about it. But when it comes to our roadway system, we all think we're better drivers than we are and that we have more control than we actually do. Honestly, there's nothing I've ever observed about human nature or psychology that convinces me people are going to correctly assess the risks of driving everywhere as their primary mode of transportation. Of course, if they assessed it correctly, they'd probably stop driving as much and then you'd have to ask, Whose interest is that in? Okay, that's all I've got on Conspiracy Nerd this week. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week, and I'll see you then.